Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be with you guys this morning. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, my name is Pastor Billy, and I have a few announcements for us. Oops. Sorry. Um, our first, thank you, Ju thank you, Judah. Our first announcement is uh, Icon. Uh, we have Icon. It's our middle school and high school uh, ministry. It's after church every Sunday from 12:30 uh, to about 2:30, um, and it's a great time. We've been going through the the Book of John, the Gospel of John. It's a lot of fun. Uh, kids love it. The adults love it. The volunteers love it. And so if you know uh, or if you are a middle school or high school kid or you know middle school or high school children who um, you would just like to invite to Icon, man, bring them. We would love to have them. It's just, like I said, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. And I think they would, too. <clears throat> that, that's today after church, on Sundays after, after church. On Tuesdays, we have our prayer gathering. Um, it's on Tuesday nights. Uh, from 7, 7 to 8 p.m., uh, and it's, it's a real sweet time. The, the, the place is pretty much how it is right now. Uh, we got some music playing, uh, and it's just a great time if you want to come and, and be with uh, other, other, uh, uh, other people at River Church as we come and pray together. Um, you can do that here if you want prayer, if you want uh, someone to pray with you or to pray over you. Uh, we do that on Tuesdays. It's a really sweet time. It's from 7 to 8 on Tuesdays. <clears throat> Community nights. So next week, I know it's, this is on Wednesdays, but we're not starting this Wednesday. We're starting next Wednesday. We're going to start our community nights. And uh, Randy has given me permission to tell you guys a secret. Now, before I tell you guys, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now you guys are like, what's the secret? Um, uh, Wednesday nights, we're going to be serving Chick-fil-A. So Chick-fil-A for eight weeks, it'll be here, it'll be packaged, so we don't need to worry about everybody grabbing each other's food. It'll be here in the back, uh, and it's our community nights on Wednesday. It's going to be a great time. Uh, I would encourage all of you to make it to that. Again, and Pastor Ryan will talk about that um, a little more. But yes, that'll be on Wednesday starting next week, not this week, but next week. Uh, community nights for eight weeks, and again, we'll be having Chick-fil-A. It's gonna be, it's gonna be great. I'm gonna, I'm really looking forward to it. So, <clears throat> get connected. Um, before, before I talk about this, there's a slide that's not up, but this upcoming Friday we are having a team appreciation dinner. So, what that means is if you serve in any way, uh, you should have received an email from me. Uh, but if you didn't, I, I don't have everyone's email. So if you did not receive an email from me, but you do serve at River Church, come find me so I can give you that information. Uh, but that's going to be this Friday uh, from 6 to 7.30 here at River Church. It's just a team appreci appreciation dinner. We, we, we love you guys. We thank you for serving River Church. And uh, we want to just esteem you and appreciate you on that day. So that's, again, that's on Friday. Uh, you should have received an email, but if you have not, please come come find me, and we'll get you all the information for that, okay? Get connected. Uh, as you came in, if you are a first-time guest, you should have received a, a welcome card, a connection card. Uh, fill that out. If you're a first-time guest, hang on to it. After the service, uh, go take it to the welcome table, and, and we will be there uh, to greet you and to say hello to you. Uh, for everyone else, uh, that's your connection card to us a way for you guys to communicate with us. Uh, well, there's many ways to do it, but this is one of the practical ways that we do it here at River Church. So if you have a prayer request, uh, if, if you need prayer for something, uh, you can go ahead and write it on that card. Pastor Randy will see it, I will see it, and we will be in prayer for you during the week in that specific way. So <clears throat> I believe that is it. Oh, last one, home is here. It's a big one, guys. Next Sunday is our home is here. Sunday. It's, it's our back to church Sunday. You should have received a card on the way in. It's our invitations to uh, this, this back to church Sunday, and we're calling it Home is Here. Uh, as I've said before, man, we believe that home can be found here, right? Home can be found in uh, this body of believers, and, and we, we want to extend our home invitation to everybody. So if you have friends who maybe stopped going to church or you know some people who maybe you've wanted to invite to church for a while, but you've never really had a good opportunity to, 
uh, this upcoming Sunday is a great Sunday to do that. It's called, again, it's called Home is Here. We're going to be kicking off a new sermon series, and that's next Sunday. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I have my people in mind who I'm going to go uh, and deliver a card to to invite them. So I'm going to do that this week. <clears throat> And I would encourage you, if you guys have those friends too, those, maybe those neighbors, those relationships, those coworkers, of people who you want to see come, uh, next Sunday uh, is, is, the, is the, the Sunday that you want to invite them back to church. So with that said, I think that's it. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we are able to come and uh, just gather together, Lord. Um, Holy Spirit, I pray that you uh, just speak to us, Lord. I pray that you speak through Pastor Randy. I pray that you just soften our hearts and allow us to be shaped by your word and into the image of Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I I was a little bit surprised that I thought there would be cheering and raising a fist when we said Chick-fil-A. Listen, if you don't like Chick-fil-A, uh, first of all, you might want to re-examine your salvation. Uh, Amen. That's what, I mean, that, that's what we do, right? Christian, Christians, we eat Chick-fil-A, we, we shop at Hobby Lobby, we, we do all the, all the things that Christians do. However, if you don't like Chick-fil-A, no more judgment. That was enough judgment. You, uh, you, uh, seriously, you're welcome to bring your bring something. That's totally cool with us. If you want to bring your own food, I don't want to make it harder on you. But if you don't like Chick Fil A, don't like Chick Fil A. That's cool. Bring something else, or maybe you've got some special dietary need. Maybe you're on a diet. Whatever. Bring 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 whatever you want. We might even uh, we might even have uh, an opportunity to to share some food as well. We're trying to we're trying to respect the fact that we're still in this weird time where we're trying to keep our germs to ourselves, and so we think. Eight weeks of Chick-fil-A, I don't know, that sounds pretty good to me. So that's what we're doing. Um, home is here, home is here. Uh, I don't mean to, well, yeah, I guess I do mean to put you on, your, on the spot. If you already know who you're going to invite, would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? Uh, okay, we got some work to do. That's what today's sermon is, all, is, is about, really. Lydia and I, just this morning, we were deciding who we were going to invite. I've already done some inviting. Uh, we're taking an approach, we're taking an approach so far where, like, I've got, people, dudes that I hang out with that don't go to church, so I'm going to invite some of them, and she's got some ladies that, so we're not doing like a family approach, but you may want to do a family approach, and we might, but we're just, so we're evaluating that, and we're like, man, no way in the world would that person come, but I'm going to invite them anyway, because if they did come, man, that'd be a real win, you know, so we're, we're, we're having that discussion in, in our house, and uh, I just ran into somebody who, um, I forgot to even tell one of my family members this. I'm just I'm, now I'm talking to myself. Uh, forgot to tell him this, but I ran into somebody at the uh, at the uh, the water mill yesterday. Who uh, he he lives Kings lives lives somewhere else now. Uh, but he told me he said, "Hey, Randy, I came to River Church when you guys were meeting at Rancho Viejo. Well, if you were there in the in the early days, you know we only met there like two or three times. I just I was touched at the fact that he wanted to know more about the church. He doesn't live here anymore. He wanted to know more about the church." He asking questions about River Church. Uh, anyway, uh, he's one of those guys, like an unlikely sale. Like, you wouldn't think that guy would go to church. Invite those people. They might come. That's the point. That is the point. Okay, so we're getting ready for this. We're getting ready for Back to Church Sunday, and in, in that, that, that kicks off our fall activities. It kicks off our Wednesday night uh, the community nights that we'll do that for eight weeks that'll take us into the holidays. Uh, it kicks off our sermon series. Um, there are a lot of things that that uh, it's kind of the hinge pin or the everything. It begins with that day, one week from today. So it's a big deal. And I'm asking you. I'm going to go over this again at the end. But I'm asking you to consider inviting um, three friends to church. And then I'm asking you to uh, consider uh, also inviting them over for lunch or taking them out to lunch if your finances um, allow you to do that. And for some of us, your finances don't. Um, Lydia and I, considering the same thing, given the uniqueness of our friends, how might this work best? 
How can we invite them in such a way that it doesn't, doesn't put too much pressure on them? Like maybe the lunch for some people is too much pressure. You know, it doesn't freak them out, but it, it's just a warm, inviting, authentic, genuine. It's going to go something like this. Hey, no pressure. Uh, next Sunday at, at, at my church, it's, it's a Sunday for people that don't normally go to church. So you can come, and if you hate it, you don't have to come back. But it's actually a service for people who don't normally go to church. So, so maybe, it's, maybe it's for you, man. I would be honored if you would today write the name or the names of some of the people that you're going to invite on your connection card and turn it in in the offering basket when it comes by today. Uh, I promise you that I will pray much for your friends if you'll give me their names. In today's Bible passage, we are uh, looking at a picture of Jesus as he commissions 11 guys to go out and change the world. Now, I'm not Jesus and you're not the 11 disciples, but there is some parallel as we say, hey, let's, let's go out and make a difference. It's called the Great Commission. You're probably familiar with it. Um, I want to look at it. There are so many facets to this commission that Jesus gives, so many different ways of looking at it. I've preached on it before. Um, one of our missionaries uh, preached on it just like six weeks ago. But I want to look at it through maybe a slightly different lens today. It's called the Great Commission. It's Jesus commissioning his followers to go out and change the world. Let's read it, Matthew 28. I'm going to start in a section that maybe people don't normally start at when they preach it. I'm going to go a few verses earlier, and it says this. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, and why not 12? Some of you know, don't answer out loud, the 11, not 12. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. could also mean the, the hillside in the original language, not necessarily climbing to the pinnacle of a mountain, but went to the mountain or to the hill side, which Jesus had told them to go to. And when they saw Jesus, this, the 11 guys, they, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And that's the best English word that we have, but it, it means more than just doubted. It's like they're not sure that they're in, right? In the original, it would mean like, Maybe I'm in, maybe I'm not. I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure you, you say you are. I'm not sure I want to be a part of this. I'm not sure that I'm convinced that this is going anywhere. They doubt it. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, again, this is the 11, who go to Galilee, go to the mountainside. Some of, they, they, they worship. Some of them aren't even sure they want to be there. Like maybe they, maybe they don't want to. Okay. And, and Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right, so what do we have here? We have this last moment in Jesus' life on earth. So he's going to speak last, his last words. And they're going to be lasting words. They're going to be significant words. And so Jesus looks at his 11 Galilean friends that he may have known growing up. He looks at 11 disciples. Why only 11? Because one, because one of his prized pupils has, has already hung himself. He already gave up. He already quit. He looks at 11 disciples. The records say that they worshipped him, but some of them, didn't, some of them weren't even convinced they should be there. Right? Eleven disciples, they see him, they worship, but some doubt. He looks at, at those eleven guys 
11 Galileans, uneducated. They had this hick draw about how they talked. They were fishermen. They were not sophisticated. He looks at these 11 men. Some of them don't even believe in him. And he says to them, he says, with the talent in this circle, I can change the world. Right? No, that's not at all what he said. He would have been crazy to have faith in those 11 guys who weren't even sure they wanted to be there. No, what he says is this. He says, God, help us. All authority has been given to me, gentlemen. He says, all authority has been given to me. And on that basis, on the basis of my authority, Jesus says, therefore, we're going to build the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus said, God, God has authorized and commanded me to commission you And here's how we are going to build the church. So that's what we're talking about today. We'll get there and unpack that word by word here in just a second. But that's the, that's the backdrop. Um, that is the context. Lest we make the 11 disciples, you know, and Peter the rock, uh, lest we make too much of them. The context bears out the fact that Jesus' confidence was not in these men, nor is his confidence in you and me. Jesus' confidence is in, is in the authority which has been bestowed upon him. I want to just lay a little foundational work. Uh, some of you weren't here last week, and I want to just, the, the last week's ser- sermon and today's sermon really are partners, and so I, I want to lay a little foundation or a little review. Um, last week, Jesus says this. Last week, Jesus says, when Jesus said, when you look out over a field that is ripe unto harvest. Like we're moving into the fall now, and so my, my greenish, yellowish um, grapefruit are starting to turn a little more pink and starting to turn a little more orange. And, and soon the tree branches will sag just a bit. And it's ripe unto harvest. And Jesus used to, several occasions when he was here on earth, he, he would look at Jerusalem and the, the lostness, the people that did not, did not follow him. They were spiritually lost. Or he would move through Samaritan villages, Jesus would, and he would see the lostness, the spiritual lostness, the brokenness. And he would he would say, this is like, like, a, a, like, a, like a, a field that is ripe and, and ready to be spiritually harvested. And so I believe that, that if Jesus were here today, like if he and I would have hung out this weekend, you'd know he's here, but he and I hung out and I drove him, I drove him around, drove him out by the airport, and I drove him down Alton Glore and the new 511 thing and 550 or whatever that is, and I, you know, I drove him over around Las Prietas or drove him down by the river or over by Pace, or, you know, and, I, and then I brought him here today, and he got up, he would be like, he would say to you guys, he would say, like, Brownsville is ripe unto harvest. He would say that there were many lost souls needing to be saved. It is it is, it is a field ripened to harvest. And then, uh, this is, again, just a review from last week. He would say this. He, he would say, here's what I want you to do. Here's what, I, here's what I instruct you to do, Jesus would say. He would say, you ask the, the Lord of the harvest, God the Father, you ask the Lord of the harvest if he would send more laborers. Jesus wasn't worried or fearful when he left this task in the hands of the 11 apostles because he, he knew it wasn't, it wasn't um, based on the authority or the power or the ownership of the 11 apostles. He, know, he knew there's the Lord, the Lord of the harvest, and he is ultimately in charge of the harvest. 
And so this week, last week, that's how Jesus described it. The Lord is, uh, God is the Lord of the harvest. It's his harvest. You just pray that he would send more laborers. You trust in him. He's the Lord of the harvest. And in slightly different language, but again, Jesus is causing us to, to not fear. This week, Jesus' language is, look, all authority has been given to me in heaven, on earth. And on, on the basis of that authority, we, we're going to build the church. We're going to grow the church. We're going to save the lost. So on Tuesday night, I was here, and I was praying for some of you. Some of you asked me to pray for you by name, and I prayed for you by name. I was praying for... Um, stuff going on in my life, and I was praying for the big invite Sunday coming up next week, and I was praying for, uh, yeah, for the, for the, uh, the Back to Church Sunday. Um, again, this was Tuesday night, so just a few nights ago. And I was a little nervous. I was a little fearful. I was like, like what if you guys, you, the people here, what if you don't invite, you know? What if you don't? What if you don't show, what if you don't, you don't come through? You know, like, what if you don't come through for me? You know, terrible way of thinking about it, right? But I'm just being, just, just, just giving you a window in my heart. What if you don't come through? What if people don't come? A little nervous, a little fear. And, and I, I believe the Lord really spoke to me in a very clear manner when he said to me, Randy, the fear that you have reveals a false motive in your heart. He reminded me, this is my harvest Brownsville's my town. Jesus says it's, it's my authority that is the fuel that drives the engine of the church. So the honest truth is if Pastor Randy is, is fretting or, or, or fearful, then I'm relying on my own strength. Now this is Jesus' church. And it's based on Jesus' authority. And, and, and we're, we're simply called to, to be obedient, to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, if you're not obedient to that, then, that, then that's a problem. But it's not your effectiveness or, or your talent or your abilities that's really at play here. It's just your obedience, your obedience to the Great Commission. So I've said... When we, when we speak our last words, you know, they're going to be lasting words. I think about that sometimes, like, and I hope I'm ready to say something really profound right before I die, because my last words, you know, they're going to be the lasting words. And honestly, that, that uh, typically you don't get to make that choice, right? But Jesus did. Jesus knew these were his last words. And, and so, I have got a summary of what he said. Let's put that next screen up. This is really what he said. All that we read earlier, this is what he said. You know, we have go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? We have that, but, um, but, but, but actually the, the original language, the emphasis, the main verb, the, the, the significance of what Jesus is saying here is not go. You know, go therefore and make all the... But, but the significance, if you look at the grammar of what Jesus said that day, what he really says is, uh, or what he does say is, make disciples. That is the main verb. And then we've got, we've got participles that, that are all around it. Participles are those I-N-G words, um, you know, going teaching, baptizing, those are words that are subservient to the main, the main verb. And so in, in the original language, what Jesus is saying mostly and mainly, the, 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 the Great Commission, what it, is, what it is about is making disciples. Now there's going involved for many, there's, there's staying involved, for many, right? Some of us go, some of us stay, some of us travel to other parts of the world, else those people would never be made into disciples. But, but the, the, the verb is make disciples. And then it gives us, you know, we're going, but then it gives us two really strong, Jesus gives really two strong participles. One is baptizing, and the other is teaching. We've made church really complex in, in some ways, 
In other ways, we haven't even, uh, sometimes we make church way too complex. Sometimes we don't even bother to think what we're doing, like why we're at church. We just think, you know, it's just you, you go to church every Sunday so you don't feel guilty, you know. But, but so, so sometimes we make it super complicated, and sometimes we, we don't even bother to think about what we're doing. But actually, the, what Jesus said is the, the role of the church, the, the role of this great commission of going, baptizing, teaching. Ultimately, the role, the goal, rather, is make disciples. And then he closes out the whole thing with, I am with you all the days to the end of the age. Now, what does it mean to teach obedience to all that Jesus has commanded? Well, we're going to be talking about that over the next eight weeks, starting uh, this coming Sunday with this new teaching series that I'm going to begin on Sunday. We're going to be talking, what does it mean to, to, to teach people to obey all that Jesus commanded? What does it mean to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? We're going to be talking about that during our Home is Here series starting next week. Yes, it means immersion, means baptism with, that involves water. I believe it means much more than just that. There's this Trinitarian Father, Son, and Holy Spirit robust theology behind that statement that Jesus makes. We're going to talk about all that, not today, but we're going to talk about all that during the next series that's coming up, and we're going to be talking about it on, Sun on Wednesday nights when we come here for community night. I want to give you three big ideas today out of this passage. We're not going to unpack that a great deal, but I want to give you three big ideas. First big idea is this. Jesus' life was devoted to the expansion of the gospel uh, uh, the to the expansion of the gospel reach beyond the boundaries of Judaism. If you think, if you're a stu student of the Bible or if you've read the Bible thoroughly, uh, carefully, then think on this for a minute. You may never, never have thought about it in this way, but everything Jesus ever did during his three years of ministry <clears throat> was, was pushing the boundaries, pushing the gospel outside of, of Judaism. He was, he was angering the, 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 the Jewish religious leaders. He was going places where Jews weren't, where Samaritans were. He was hanging out with people. He was, he was saying things at times that, that people thought uh, meant he wanted to abolish the law, which he didn't. But he was always pushing. He wanted to see the gospel go beyond Judaism. He regularly visited places and people that others would say that's unclean, that's dirty, that's trashy. He did this to the degree such that others accused him of being a drunk, uh, and a glutton, and a sinner. If you ask me, Pastor Randy, do you think he was any of those? I would say no. Jesus was not a drunk. He was not a glutton. He was not a sinner. But he must have had really good friends who were drunks. He must have really spent time with people who were gluttons. And he must have spent a lot of time with sinners because he was falsely accused of all three of those lifestyles. They could not understand, the, the Jews, they could not understand why and how he cared for those outside of their circle of trust. And we struggle with the same thing, don't we? How could we possibly care about those outside of our circle of trust? But he did. Jesus did. What is the modern day equivalent? Who would Jesus go uh, visit and invite to our service next Sunday? I'm convinced that Jesus would be all about Back to Church Sunday. Who would he invite? Verse 19 says this. Go to the next screen. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. I'm going to talk about that just briefly. Um, all nations. Panta ta ethne. You hear the word ethnos or eth ethnicity in that original Greek, panta ta ethne, all nations. Um, we talked about this some um, six weeks ago when our, when our missionary preached on this passage, so I don't want to go too much deeper here, but I do want to point out that, that of all nations does not really 
Let me say it this way. Pantata ethne doesn't just mean of all nations. Like I'm going to go to China, I'm going to go to the Philippines, and I'm going to go to Russia, or I'm going to, or I'm going to go to Canada, or I'm going to go to Chile. Or I'm going to, you know, it doesn't mean that that exactly of all nations is an adequate is an adequate uh, interpretation, but it doesn't fully capture what Jesus is really saying. He's saying he could be saying all the Gentiles, which most of us in here are Gentiles. We're not Jewish. He could have been saying all of the known nations in that day. He could have been saying all the pagans, the people that don't yet know me, all the peoples, all the people groups. What Jesus is saying is all the people outside of Judaism that don't know me, we're going to go and we're going to reach them. And Jesus is saying this is going to be the makeup of the church. This rich, diverse group of people that don't necessarily look alike, don't necessarily have the same cultural background. Jesus would be seeking those people out. People that, that, that didn't grow up like you and me, although maybe they, they, they are completely Hispanic, or maybe they are completely white, having grown up in the valley, but, but they have different life experiences, and they've got different hurts, and they, like, maybe I'm not comfortable around them because they didn't grow up the way that I did, and Jesus would seek out and save those lost people along with every other. Jesus was always devoted to, his life was devoted to the expansion of the gospel beyond the context of his, his circle of people. Second big idea is this. Jesus has confidence in the church. You see that. Where I'm going with this, I want to challenge your confidence in the church. I want to do it gently, but that's where I'm headed with this. So Jesus had confidence in the church. He says, okay, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to make disciples of all nations by baptizing them and teaching them to observe everything you've heard me say. You better write down what I said. Don't forget it because we're going to teach everybody what I'm saying. And that is an enormous charge, isn't it, for 11 guys that aren't even sure they want to follow Jesus? But Jesus had this, you see it on, in, the word, in, the, in the words on the page, this, this enormous confidence in the church to achieve the mission, the mission that the church has been commissioned to accomplish. And think about it. Like if I would have been there that day, if you would have been there that day, we would have, we would have, Maybe like you feel about River Church right, right now, you're like, man, I don't know if we could have that big of an impact on, on Brownsville. I mean, kind of a small church, COVID kind of did a number on us, and like that, that kind of attitude, if we were there that day and Jesus was like, to the 11 disciples, we're going to reach all nations, all ethnos, all people groups, whatever exactly he meant, we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do. If you and I would have been there today, we would have snickered a little bit. We're like, like, these guys can't even speak good Aramaic, you know, or they can't even speak good Koine Greek. Their Hebrew is atrocious. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna reach the entire world with these eleven dudes. Like that's would have, that would have been our our attitude, but but Jesus, that wasn't his attitude because he had this enormous confidence in the church. And think about this now. 2,000 years later, I, I get emotional just, just saying, just describing this to you. Think about this. 2,000 years later, the church, she's just fine. Kings and kingdoms have risen and fallen. Philosophies and philosophers have lived and died. But the church, she's been steady and true. 
Man, if you, if you attach your, um, your identity to, to anything else, to any other entity, to any other group, to any other nation, just know that if you're, you're, if you're a student of history, you already know this. Kingdoms rise and fall. That, that's, that's, why, that's why it's described in the New Testament that, that our identity, um, our, 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 our loyalty is first and foremost to the kingdom of God. Jesus had enormous confidence in the church, and I asked, do we? Jesus expects the church to last for the ages, and it has. It has outlasted all the other entities that I've already described. The church, she cannot be stamped out. The church cannot be killed off. The church cannot be quieted. At every point in history, when, when, when men and women attempt to quiet the church, it's unsuccessful. It always has been. It always will be. We cannot mess up the church because it is based on the fact that all authority has been given to Jesus. That's why he started with that statement. The church cannot be killed off because it's not based on any human authority. It's based on the authority of Jesus in heaven and on earth. Jesus initiated the church. And so if we think that in our lives and in our lifestyles that the church is, is optional, then we're really totally missing out on the mission and the commission of Jesus that he has invited us into. The first use of the word church, and this so fascinates me. I think about this. I may, I may write a paper on this someday. Uh, like, how did church, the word church, ever become the word church, right? And I, we don't have days, and so I'm not going to go into that in detail. But, but, like, they didn't use the word church. The Jews, they would go to the temple, they would go to the synagogue, and then all of a sudden, one day, Jesus starts talking about the church. I want to show you the first use of the word church. It's Matthew chapter 16. Jesus, it's a teaching moment. Specifically with, with, with Peter. This is earlier on, right? Because today I'm, we're in Matthew 28. Now we're going all the way back to Matthew 16. I'm talking about the origin of the word church. Matthew 16. Jesus said to, um, to, to, the, to the disciples, Who do you say that I am? Because he'd already asked them who do others say that I am. Who do you say that I am? And, and Peter, specifically, Simon Peter replied, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you Simon Barjona? For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Have you ever have you ever had one of those moments where like you feel like somebody says something and you're like that was that was deep? Like I don't think I don't think a, a human being taught like I think that the Lord just spoke to and through that person. That's what Jesus said. Jesus is saying, "Blessed are you. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you." And I tell you, I, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my First time the word's ever found in the New Testament, church. Now, they used the word ecclesia. I don't know if they were speaking in, they might have been speaking in Aramaic that day, but at least what we have in Greek is ecclesia. But that, that's the first time we ever find it. I tell you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And lights go off. Okay, now we're talking about church. Like we've never been talking about, Jesus hasn't been talking about this. First time ever. Church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing. If you ever grew up in a, if you ever spend time in a charismaniac context, then I am a charismatic. But if you're charismaniac, loosing and binding and binding and loosing. That's where they get that from. Uh, Not the point. The point is, um, the point is the church Ecclesia, I think we have that word. The church, it means a lot of different things. It means church, it does, like we use the word, the English word church, but it, 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 means, uh, it means gathering. When they heard the word that day, they probably didn't, because they didn't have any context. They didn't, they'd never been to a Sunday morning worship service. 
you know, where you've got to, yeah, they didn't have that. So, so they would have heard gathering or, or movement. They would have heard that. He would have said, on you, I will build this gathering, this movement, this assembly of, of the people of faith. They might have heard that. Assembly of the people of faith. In, 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 in Greek, it really, just meant, it really just meant gathering or congregation. And, it, it, you know, to, in today's, uh, in, in modern-day Christianity, it is so popular. It is so, so uh, popular to say that the church is... We're the people of God, right? We're not a building, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not a building. We're, we're the people of God. But you know, we're actually more than that. I mean, the word, according to the word, we, we're the people of God gathered. We, we're the people of God who assemble, who gather, who, who, who congregate together regularly. In fact, in fact, the Bible is really not primarily written to you as an individual. Now, that may rock your world. You may, you may, you may think that's you know counter to what you've always been taught as a Christian. Do I believe in personal Bible study? Yes. Do I believe you should be in God's Word on a regular basis and read it? On, yeah, on your own. Yes. But this is a book that was written to the congregation. The people of faith, the, the gathering, the Christians who gathered on a regular basis. Look at every book in the New Testament, and almost every one of them says to the church. Even books like, even the book of Philemon, which I'm doing a deep dive in the, the, over the next few months, it's to Philemon, it's to his wife or sister, to his maybe his brother, and to the church that meets in your house. It's a, very personal, it's a very personal letter, the book of Philemon. And yet, even that book is written, this is a book that is written to the congregation because the church, we are not just the people of God, we are the people of God gathered. The Apostle Paul later defines the church in this way in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those, and this is how he describes the church, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Jesus had confidence in the church. That's the point. Jesus had confidence in the church, not because of the ingenuity uh, or the talent pool that we find here, but because the power of the church is based on the authority of Jesus. No. Now, coming back full circle to the question I asked earlier, do we have confidence in the church? Do we as Christ followers, personal relationship with Jesus Christ has been the, 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 the main talk in Christianity over the last century at least, and I believe in it. I believe that every one of us has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But the fact is, the Bible talks way more about the congregation the, the, the gathering, the powerful movement, the powerful entity that is the church. And I think we've lost that. I've seen an erosion of confidence in the church even in my lifetime. As a younger man, as a younger man, it's going to make me sound like an old man now, what, what I'm about to say, but as a younger man, um, and I just went to a really solid, a really good church. I grew up at First Baptist Church. But this was true of other churches, not just First Baptist. As a younger man, um, the, committed, uh, the committed were like, they were committed beyond belief. And, and, and now, um, and, 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 and they were, I don't want to offend anybody here. but so, so back then, the committed, they went to church every week. And if you're really committed, uh, Keith and Gracie can tell you this. Like, you didn't just go Sunday mornings. You went Sunday night. 
You don't go Sunday night, you went Wednesday night. And I know there's some baggage and some, some uh, legalism, I guess, involved in that. But that's what it, like, because there was just this deep confidence in the church when I was a young boy that I think has, has eroded some. And when, when, when I was a younger man, the, those who were committed to the church had deep confidence in the church. Church, Billy, Pastor Billy and I were just talking about this today or, or yesterday he, or Friday. He grew up this way too. Like you, the, the committed in the church, they, they gave 10% or more of their income to the church because they had confidence in the church. And they had confidence not in like the pastor, but they had confidence in the authority of Jesus in the church. That was the norm. And there's just been an erosion of that confidence in the church in the last several decades. And I know, because I'm pretty, I'm pretty savvy and a little bit woke, like, I, I totally understand that we could talk about like cultural trends and we could talk about whatever. Like, I totally understand all the complexities culturally that the church is up against now. But I'll just tell you, I'll go to church, I'll go to pastors' conferences now, and it's not just me. As pastors, we'll talk about, like, now the church, the, the committed, like, the, the, the committed people um, go to church, like, twice a month. I, I mean, I, I, when other people tell me that, it just confirms, like, what I see. Now, I realize, like, people busy, people travel, that's all good, that's all fine, but, but there's just been, in addition to our busy lifestyles, in addition to traveling, there's also just been this lack of, among many churchgoers, lack of confidence in the church. Like, I, I don't know that she's just, she, she, she seems to fight some social battles and sometimes screams loud in the political scene, but is she really all that? And I'm telling you, the church, she's going nowhere. I want to bolster your confidence in the church. I want you to believe like the church is something that I should, I should jump in, both feet. The church is something I should, with my pocketbook, with, with my best gift financially, I should jump in because I have confidence in the church. Jesus did the last, okay, no more offensive language. Uh, last, the last statement, uh, the last big idea today is this. Jesus promises to be with us until the end. Until the end. Which is what we need to hear right now, isn't it? I mean, many of us, all of us, there's just a sense of like, where's this all headed? Like, where's the world going? What, what, what's going to become of the church? Like, I want, I just want to know, I just want this confidence that, that God is with me. Take heart in the fact that when Jesus spoke this grand commission, he ended it with, I will be with you. I mean, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to send a comforter, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send, but I'll be with you. So he starts, he starts this whole commissioning with, look, this is all based on my authority. Don't, don't sweat it. It's not based on your ingenuity. It's based on my authority in heaven and on earth. Here's the commission. And then he ends it with, and don't sweat it, I will be with you till the end. I want to invite David Mata up. We're going to do this. Do this uh, where are you? Come on up, David. Uh, I, I, he's a friend of mine. I want you to hear briefly, briefly what's what's going on uh, with with with, uh, with David Mata. Rather than me me telling and then him retelling the story, I'll just let him tell. Welcome, David. David and I have shared all you can eat tacos together a few times in the last few weeks. Come on over here. This is David. Hey, hi, what David? Hey, that... All right, I've got just a few questions. Um, David, how did you ever? Actually, before I, before I, how long have you been? How long have you been attending River Church? Uh, uh, 
closer? Right there. Probably about nine weeks. Nine weeks, okay. I remember the first time you came, the first time I met you. You kind of a loner sitting by yourself for a while. Now you got a Kobo sitting with you and you coming on Tuesday nights. But yeah, I remember that, about nine weeks. That's a, how did you hear about River Church ever in the first place? Uh, I played Pokemon Go, and uh, I, saw, I saw that there was a church here a few months ago. And uh, uh, back, in, back in July, I was like in a really dark place, and uh, I felt I needed to reach out or look for, for the word, hear, hear a message or something. So. I know the answer to this question, but I mean, I know the answer to all these questions. Where do you live? I live in the border apartments right next door. Just right next door. Yeah. Okay. And so Pokemon Go, like if you know what that is, you're old like me, but I got kids, so I kind of understand. But something's going on here. Like you play Pokemon Go, we got a little like stop here. Yeah. And I think I even know who, uh, who, who, who made that happen. But anyway, they've got that. And that, what a weird way for Jesus to bring somebody to church. Weird and not a bad, like that's just, yeah. What a unique way for God, for Jesus to draw someone to, to church. Okay. Um, so my my question, um, you've kind of already answered, but I'm going to ask it one more time. Why did you come the first time, the very, very first time? Um, I was looking for, for comfort. I was, some stuff was going on in my life, so uh, I was reading the Bible, and something made me think, hey, I need to go to church. And then I remember on Pokemon, I saw that there was a church, a church nearby, so I came Last question. Why did you keep coming? Because, man, like in the last nine weeks, um, like you and John Masso have been to church more than I have. Uh, so, <laughs> right? Um, why did you keep coming? Um, everybody's been really friendly, and uh, I, like, I like the way you deliver your sermons, and Pastor Billy, I like the way he delivers the sermon, so I like to hear the word, and I like the message. Bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here's what I'm asking you to do. What I'm asking you to do is what I asked you to do last week, so it's real simple. Um, number one, I invite you to come this Tuesday night and pray for your friends, and and pray for Brownsville. And if you don't know, some of you told me this, like, Randy, I don't hardly know anybody that doesn't go to church. I, I understand. I understand that we, you know, especially in the last year, the last year and a half has only bolstered our, our isolated lifestyles, right? I get that. Um, I want more f- for you than that. But, but come on Tuesday night and pray. Pray for your friends. Pray for the city. Maybe read through Matthew 28 and pray through the Great Commission. Come and pray with us Tuesday night. The second thing I invite you to do is this. I invite you to invite. Go to that second one. Good. Yeah, invite three people to church this coming Sunday. They may not all come. Maybe they will. Maybe some of us will have one success or two successes. Or even if nobody comes, it's still a success because, because you're being obedient. And that's success. The third thing I ask you to do is don't just, don't just invite them. Bring them at 1030 for breakfast tacos. I don't think we've said that today, but we said it last week. But we're having breakfast tacos at 1030 and then 11 a.m. the service. Everybody come at 1030 for breakfast tacos so we can eat them all, okay? A week from today, come at 10.30 for breakfast tacos. Bring your friends. Latin number four, consider making them lunch or taking them out to lunch. Again, your out is um, this Sunday is designed for people that don't normally come to church. So you, get a, you, you can come this week, and if you, don't, if you don't want to come again, you don't have to. Or you can put it on me. You can be like, man, I really want to impress my pastor. Would you come with me to church so they'll make me look good? Whatever you want to say. Whatever you want to say. Let, <laughs> let, us, uh, let us pray right now that God would be in this. God, 
I do believe that you are right in the middle of this. That this is your heart for Brownsville. That you are in the business of, of saving the lost. Lord, this is your This is your harvest. This is your city. You care way more about Brownsville than I do and than we do and we care a lot we care a lot about it and you care more. God, I pray that that you would if you're in this, and, and we, we believe that you are, Pastor Billy and I, we believe that you're in this, this, this Back to Church Sunday. If, you, if, you're in, if you're in this, and we as a church, we, we believe that you are, and that's why we're doing it. But if, if you're in this, God, then would you, would you bless this coming Sunday toward seeing um, the lost saved and, and toward seeing River Church have a, um, a really... A really exciting fall as a church. Now you, my friends, you here in the in the room right now, if you would just silently maybe speak, not out loud, but just speak one or two or three names of people that you're gonna invite. Just give that to God right now and just ask that He would even this very moment uh, be be drawing those people. Just just speak that name, just silently speak that name right now as I'm silent. pray this in Christ's name. Amen.